So yeah, my name's Andy. I work on the Search Sciences Group at Etsy as a data scientist. Um, if you're not familiar with Etsy, we're um, an online marketplace for um, handcrafted goods, vintage collectibles, arts and crafts supplies, and the work of uh, artisans, craftspeople, and makers all over the world. Um, on Search Sciences, we're responsible for things like recommendations, personalization, search relevance, and uh, basically any other ways we can use data smartly to improve user experience on the site. So we kind of work at the intersection of search and machine learning. And one of the sources of data that we use to help bridge that gap is a hierarchical taxonomy of concepts that describe all of the products that are for sale on Etsy. And you know, many sites have got uh, a taxonomy these days, whether it's of you know, written content or products for sale or uh, you know, topics of any kind. But in my experience, I, I think often taxonomic data, um, structured hierarchical metadata gets used slightly poorly by data scientists. Um, I think part of that is because it doesn't fit very well into the kind of um, tabular structure that uh, data scientists are used to working with. You know, tables or matrices or data frames aren't really the same, a good fit for kind of the tree-like um, structure of a taxonomy. So this talk's going to go through um, a few uh, tricks that you can use to try and use that data a little bit better on your own products. So what do I mean by a structured hierarchy of concepts. So this is an example from um, one node of our taxonomy, one concept, which is cast iron skillet, which actually I think is currently the deepest node in the tree. So it's got a parent which is skillets, and that's the parent of skillets is pans, the parent of skillets is pots and pans and so on, all the way up to this root node, all categories, which is kind of a virtual dummy node because there are no products directly associated with that root node. They're all associated with some node further down the tree. So this is, if you like, a view down one branch of that tree. Um, so the structure of the taxonomy encodes these parent-child relationships between concepts. Um, and they're not mutually exclusive, and they're also not symmetrical. So they're unlike some of the features that data scientists use in feature vectors for machine learning, but they're also um, unlike the, the labels that you would typically use as the output of a classification task, for example. So they're, they're uh, not mutually exclusive in the sense that if something is a skillet, it is by definition also a pan, because pan is a parent of skillet. But they're asymmetrical in the sense that if something is a pan, that doesn't imply that it is necessarily a skillet, because pans have other children as well that you can't see here, because we're just looking at one branch, remember. So as well as this, uh, these parent-child relationships, the taxonomy also encodes an idea of semantic similarity as well, a little bit less explicitly. So the, in, in a way, you could say that a cast iron skillet is in some sense similar to a sauté pan, right? Not even counting the specific instances of skillet or sauté pan, but it's conceptually quite a similar thing, and it's quite close in the taxonomy. And then both the skillet and a sauté pan are kind of similar to a bowl as well, in ways. I mean, they're both kitchenware, they're both vessels of some sort. Um, but then none of those things are really that similar to a pet hat, for example. So this, this idea of similarity, there's definitely something to it, but how can we measure that? How can we put a number on it and therefore use it in, uh, in data science? So that's what the rest of this talk is going to be about. Before I get on to how to actually measure that similarity, I'll give a couple of ideas of how you could use it to justify why we would go to this effort. So one way might be, for example, if you're training a supervised model to predict the category of something, uh, a couple of examples might be if you want to auto-categorize search queries so that you can filter them uh, automatically to a particular part of the taxonomy. Or uh, another way might be if you want to um, automatically categorize newly uploaded content from users. So you can suggest, hey, it looks like you're uploading uh, 
you know, holiday photos. Is that correct, for example? Um, that's not an example from Etsy. Um, but if you, if you can get an idea of, whether, uh, of how wrong a prediction is, um, then you can use that to uh, inform the training of those models. So what do I mean by that? Well, say you're, the true label of something is lens cases, and your model predicts camera cases, which in this made-up example, there's a similarity of 0.92 between lens cases and camera cases. So that's not a terribly bad mistake. But if your model predicts laptop cases, laptop bags for a lens case, and the similarity is 0.77, that is a slightly less good mistake to make, if there's such a thing as a good mistake. So the idea is, I mean, in short, two models, they can make the same number of correct predictions, but an incorrect prediction can still be useful if it's close to the right one in certain circumstances. So if you've got a way of measuring that, you can use that similarity in the objective function or the evaluation function for a uh, machine learning model. So you know, a model that makes 10 very close mistakes might be better, all other things being equal, the one that makes one very, very wrong mistake. Another way might be if you can use these semantic distances or semantic similarities to uh, reweight or rescale item-item um, similarities. For example, if you're doing content-based recommendations. So this actually is real data from, from Etsy. Um, the query item at the top is a piece of agate mineral uh, from our craft supplies um, hierarchy, or sub-hierarchy or whatever. Um, the four rows on the left are items that have been identified as similar to that by one of our recommendation engines. And they're, I think they're almost all, or maybe even all, made of agate. Many of them are similar shapes. That's great. But um, in fact, a lot of them are finished jewelry pieces, whereas somebody who's shopping for a piece of agate probably isn't looking for suggestions from the jewelry uh, hierarchy. Um, because what they're looking for is raw materials to use. So um, on the right, it's the same query item, the same item-item similarity scores, but then reweighted by the taxonomic similarity between the query item's taxonomy node and the taxonomy nodes of each of the candidate results. I think in this case, I just got the item similarity and multiplied it by the taxonomic similarity which is between 0 and 1 to rescale it. So I think all or maybe nearly all of these are actually raw stones, you know, not raw polished stones ready to be used by a, a jewelry maker or a designer, as opposed to finished pieces, which is in most contexts a better kind of recommendation, I think. That's maybe not universally true. I mean, in some cases, you may want to recommend something that's aesthetically similar to the item that the user is looking at, but from a different category. Say, for example, they're looking at uh, a vintage biker jacket. You might want to recommend vintage biker boots to go with it. Um, so think about the user needs for a particular context, whether this kind of reweighting, re-ranking is the right thing to do or not. Um, and you know, A-B test everything, obviously. So that's a couple of ways you can use these kind of scores. So how do you actually generate those scores, like that 0.92 from lens cases to camera cases or whatever? So a lot of these methods came out of research in the 1990s on the, um, the WordNet uh, taxonomy, which is a structured hierarchy of concepts used by natural language processing researchers. Um, but they can be applied outside of the domain of uh, natural language semantics. So they've been used on topics from you know, Wikipedia articles through to molecular biology literature, and now, of course, uh, taxonomies for e-commerce sites. So the simplest possible thing you can do is just count the number of hops between the two taxonomy nodes that you're comparing. So here, I want to see how far away Boots is from Thai sneakers. So we've got one hop to shoes, one to sneakers and athletic, and one to tie sneakers. OK, that's three hops. But that's just a number out of context. That doesn't really tell you very much. So one thing that people do is then maybe divide that by twice the maximum depth of the taxonomy. So 
assuming this is zero, one, two, three, if there's nothing deeper than here, we've got max depth of three, so the distance would be three over six, which is a half, and then if you want to turn that distance into a similarity, you can subtract it from one, so it's still a half in this case. That's very simple to do, but it's not actually that good in practice. Um, part of the reason for that is that, well, for a start, if you add or remove a level of your taxonomy uh, by making a branch longer or something, then that will change the scaled scores for every pair of nodes. But more importantly, the conceptual distance that people perceive between two nodes tends to shrink as you go down the taxonomy. I mean, that's not a law of nature, but um, empirically, a lot of taxonomies and uh, structured, controlled vocabularies in general have this property. So in our case, you know, the jump from home and living to kitchen and dining, that's one hop, but that's quite a big jump because there's loads of other stuff in your home, in your garden, in your lifestyle that might be in the home and living category, but not in kitchen and dining. Whereas down at the, towards the leaf nodes, the jump from pans to skillets is conceptually a much smaller jump, right? It's a round metal thing with a handle that you cook stuff in. And the jump from skillets to cast iron skillets, which isn't even on this slide, is kind of tiny. So this happens a lot in practice. Um, so that means just counting hops isn't that great a solution. Um, so there was an approach called conceptual similarity developed by Wu and Palmer. Don't worry about all the references, by the way. I'll give you a link to a review paper at the end, which has got all of these methods in it. So if you want to follow up, you don't have to write down all the authors and dates separately. So they developed this method that takes into account not just the length of the path, but the depth of the nearest common ancestor of the two nodes. So I won't go into how the formula is derived, but basically the further down the tree that kind of linking ancestor is, the less effect on the overall similarity score the distance between the two descendant nodes is. So something that's two nodes that are joined by a very specific concept um, are generally considered to be more similar than two nodes that are joined by a very broad concept. So that, that helps, that gets us some of the way here. Um, there was another method around the same time called depth relative scaling, which actually aims to explicitly put a uh, distance on each of those hops in the tree, right? So um, it does that by looking at, um, so each, each hop is a parent and a child. It looks at how deep in the tree they are, the depth of the child, but it also looks at how many other children the parent has. So the idea being that a parent with lots of children um, is less semantically similar to any one of those children individually than, say, a parent with only two children is. And in the degenerate case, a parent with just a single child, well, why have you got another node there at all? That's kind of the same thing, because it doesn't discriminate at all. So, um, again, there's, uh, I won't go into the details of how they worked this out, but this enables them to put a, uh, a distance on every hop. So then, if you're going from boots through sneakers and down to tie sneakers, you sum up the distances of the hops that you've covered and that gives you an overall distance between those two nodes. And again, you can kind of scale that according to maximum tree depth or something. So these methods kind of, they get part of the way there, but they, they, they're not that great. They ignore one really major source of information about the taxonomy, which is how it's actually used in practice. What, uh, what is the distribution of taxonomy nodes in the specific data set that it's describing? Um, and these methods actually do a lot better than the ones that just take into account the structure of the tree. So they borrow an idea from information theory. So the information content of a concept is the negative log probability of that concept in the data set that it's describing. Now, because the concepts are hierarchical, and you know, every skillet is by definition also a pan and also a kitchen and dining item, um, the way you work that out is how frequent, for each given node, how frequent is that node or any of its descendants in your data? Right, so the root node right at the top of the, the tree, that's got a probability of one because every single concept is a descendant of the root node. So it's got probability of one, so it's got a log probability of zero because it tells you nothing about anything, right? 
Everything is a descendant of that root node, so it's got no information associated with it. So once you've got that idea um, in hand, you can start working out some slightly more sensitive and flexible ways of measuring semantic similarity that take into account shared information content. So the first person to do this was a guy called Philip Resnick in the mid-90s, um, again working on WordNet. Um, and so he characterized the, the semantic similarity of two concepts as being just the shared inf the information content of their nearest common ancestor. So kind of intuitively speaking, um, the, the information content of what these two things have in common is his definition of semantic similarity. So to get the similarity between boots and tie sneakers, you'd find their closest common ancestor, which is shoes. You'd get the probability of shoes or any descendant of shoes in your data, and you'd turn that into a negative log probability, and that's your information content. Uh, and that's your sem semantic similarity between boots and tie sneakers. The problem with that is it means that any two nodes that are descendants of the same closest common ancestor have the same similarity, regardless of their own depth or frequency in the tree. So that's kind of problematic. It works OK on WordNet for various reasons. WordNet's actually got multiple parentage and different kinds of links. But um, in practice, it's, it's a bit of a blunt instrument. It also means that um, this is kind of strange, actually. Um, the similarity of a concept with itself isn't a fixed value. It's, it depends on that concept's rarity. So the self-similarity of shoes with shoes is much lower than the self-similarity of high tops with high tops, which kind of makes sense in a way. Like the, the fuzzier a concept is, the less you can say that concept is similar to itself sort of, if you squint, but actually it's probably not what most people mean by self-similarity. They probably want a fixed value for that, like an anchor point. Also, the similarity score isn't scaled, right? It starts at zero for things that are only connected by the root node, because the root node has zero information content, but it goes up and up and up. So the bigger your data set gets and the more um, specific your taxonomy gets, the higher that uh, similarity can potentially get. So that's also kind of tricky to deal with in practice. So a couple of years later, uh, Dekang Lin um, introduced a method which actually works on other things as well as taxonomies. He called it universal similarity. But it works really well on taxonomies, because it takes into account not just what the uh, concepts have in common, the information content of their closest common ancestor, but also the information content of those concepts themselves. It seems really re like obvious in retrospect, but you know, it took a few years for somebody to, to mention this. So this means that you know, if the concepts themselves get, uh, get rarer, they have higher information content, so they have less in common from each other, because that you know, raises the, uh, the bar on the, uh, the denominator. So, um, so yeah, this solves a lot of the problems with uh, Resnick's method, because the things are then scaled from 0 to 1. Two concepts have got a similarity of 1. Sorry, the same concept has got a similarity of 1 with itself, no matter where it is in the tree or how rare it is. And again, things that are in totally different top-level branches um, have got a similarity of 0. So I usually reach for Lin in practice, because it works well on Etsy's taxonomy. The top-level categories for us are very different, like shoes or home and living or jewelry. So it makes sense to say if things are in different categories, they get a zero. There is another method, um, which I won't go into now, which if your taxonomy is more homogeneous than ours, like say it's only movies or uh, only uh, video clips or something, then maybe you want um, a non-zero Simi sorry, yeah, non-zero similarity, a finite distance between any two items, even if they are only connected by the root. So if you're interested in that one, or indeed any of these other measures, this review paper is uh, quite a good thing to look up online. And I think I'm just about out of time, so um, thanks very much. <laughs>